I'll open this meeting. It's the regularly scheduled meeting of the Transportation Public Works Committee uh, this day, August 27th. Uh, I'm Councilmember Reich. I chair the committee and I'm joined by my colleagues, Councilmembers Johnson, Palmasano, Bender, and Gordon. Uh, we are quorum and proceed with today's agenda, which has 10 items, uh, nine of which are consent. The final is discussion. Uh, I'll go through the consent items. Uh, any committee member can pull them for further deliberation. Uh, as they wish. Uh, item one is the contract amendment with Global Specialty Contractors Incorporated for PV Plaza construction project. Item two is the contract amendment with Park Construction Company for 18th Avenue Northeast Street reconstruction project. Item three is the memorandum of understanding with Minneapolis Park and Rec Board for Solid Waste and Recycling Services. Item four is the negotiation with Metro Transit for cost participation related to the D-Line Bus Rapid Transit project. Item five is the non-governmental tax exempt parcel, street maintenance 2020 assessments. That's a designation of setting public hearing uh, for October 15th. Six uh, related item, non-governmental tax exempt parcel for uh, street light operation fee 2020 assessments. And that public hearing will also be October 15th. Item seven is the special service districts, um, the non-428 districts and their proposed services and service charges and setting that public hearing for October 15th. I, item eight is the water and sewer service line repair assessments, setting that public hearing also October 15th. Item nine is the 26th Avenue South project, and that's a pedestrian refuge island and traffic signal project layout approval and a cooperative agreement as well. Uh, does anyone wish to pull any of the consent items? Seeing none, I'll move them all as submitted. All in favor say aye. Aye. Consenting name. That carries, we can move to our final item, item 10. Good morning, Director Hutchinson. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Our discussion item today is an update on the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan. Specifically, Kathleen Mayel with Transportation Planning and Programming will be providing an update on our engagement study. We wanted to come and provide this to you today because it's a critical piece of input as we are developing our strategies and our actions. As a quick reminder, and I think Kathleen will also say this, we're really building upon the work of Minneapolis 2040, using that as a critical piece of input as well as the engagement. So with that, I will turn it to Kathleen Mayo. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Reich and Council Members. My name is Kathleen Mayo, Supervisor, Transportation Planner in the Transportation Planning and Programming Division of Public Works, and here to share um, a lot about what we heard over the earlier part of this year. I'll quickly frame up where we're at and give some context also at the end for our upcoming draft plan. So the Transportation Action Plan, again, is this 10-year document which will guide our planning, design, and implementation of transportation projects throughout the city, building from 2040 and developed in coordination with the Vision Zero Action Plan. So the engagement piece that I'm reporting on um, was co-hosted with Vision Zero public engagement as well. There are six goals that frame all the work that we're doing around the Transportation Action Plan, um, looking at climate change and how we can mitigate and, and um, not be such a contributor toward climate change. Our Vision Zero work, developing equitable outcomes for all, prosperity, increasing mobility options, and working with our partners because we know we can't do this alone. We are organizing all of our upcoming strategies and actions around these seven topic areas to develop the Transportation Action Plan. So from January through June of 2019, um, all, quite, you know, most everybody in our transportation planning and programming division was engaged and just want to recognize some of my colleagues around the room. Um, this was a really, the results here are the product of a lot of effort on many people um, and I'm just presenting the work of our team. So we hosted um, three different organization-based workshops, seven community dialogues, which I'll explain more in a bit, 10 different board forums hosted by uh, different council members throughout the city, five community workshops, an online open house, which um, was the first time we had done something like this, and re received over 1,000 views, um, a really effective way to reach a lot of people, although it was a more of a one-way dialogue. Um, community contracts, we issued six community contracts, which I'll, which I'll explain in a bit more detail, and uh, a lot of different opportunities to engage online through our Transportation Action Plan website. We've produced three different products that are all available on our website. Um, the first is actually a bundle of seven different summaries from our community dialogues, and I'll um, share a little bit of the highlights from those in a minute. A summary from our community contracts work, and then a total summary of our phase two engagement. 
For the community dialogues, which I'll focus on first, uh, the main themes that we heard through these um, conversations, which we co-hosted with our Neighborhood and Community Relations Department, as well as our coordinator's office, Office of Equity and Inclusion, they were hosting community dialogues around the Strategic Racial Equity Action Plan, and so we hosted these conversations jointly in order to um, make efficient use of those community members we were asking to come join a conversation. Um, and the focus on the transportation side was really on pedestrian issues, transit issues, and safety. So I'll go into a little detail of the major themes from each of the different workshops that we hosted, or the dialogues. Um, but those were really across the board the themes that we heard the most about. In the East African Community Dialogue, a real focus on pedestrian safety, um, both through lighting and our infrastructure, and specific projects in the community that they felt were important to really improve their community now. With the African American Community Dialogue, there was a focus again on convenient, safe, and efficient transportation, improving transit through safety improvements, comfort and affordability, and again, pedestrian scale lighting was another theme. With the Southeast Asian, there was a focus, uh, community dialogue, there was a focus on the building of relationships and how that can support um, accessing new modes of travel. There were safety concerns, again, um, related to lighting on the street. And, um, you know, this is a, a pretty broad statement, but the idea that making travel safe and easy is really important in terms of opening up transportation options. With the Latino community dialogue, there was a focus on improving year-round transportation options for those who don't drive, linking toward our sidewalk condition and maintenance of our bikeways and sidewalks in the winter. And again, transit and wanting um, a, the more feeling of safety and comfort on transit. In our Native American community dialogue, there was more of a focus um, on some of the illegal vehicle behaviors that they're experiencing. This links with um, some of the data from our Vision Zero crash studies that we looked at where our Native American residents are most disproportionately impacted by severe and fatal crashes. So it follows that this was a, a large concern within that community. There was the desire to want to see increased access to transit and shared mobility options in the community, both through education and outreach and then um, broader just collaboration around transportation issues uh, with the community. With the Peoples with Disabilities uh, conversation, there was a real focus on consistent designs as we're introducing new types of projects into the system, that there was consistency so that they're able to navigate the system, um, that there was inclusion of people with disabilities in the proliferation of shared mobility options in the city, and that we're looking to preserve access to destinations through that consistent design and maintenance of our facilities. And finally, we hosted a conversation with the Minneapolis Youth Congress, and um, these are high school students, and the focus here was really on support for those non-motorized options, walking, biking, transit, and the link there to climate change as being very important. There was a desire to see increased reliability and service and reduced costs for public transit, and broadly speaking, transportation sa safety, particularly around transit. And I think that this last quote, which is a, a direct quote, um, is a really interest. you know, it's, a, it's one we need to pay attention to, because right now it's saying, I assume I'll be driving a car in 10 years because it's the easiest way to get around. And so that's the reality of somebody looking toward their future. And, you know, we heard a lot of links about that in terms of age restrictions, say for scooters, or you know, you're able to get a driver's license but not ride a scooter at 16, that type of thing. So interesting um, to have these conversations and hear in their own words. So we did something a little bit different. Um, we put out an open call for engagement services um, at the end of last year. And we contracted with six different organizations and artists to extend our outreach. And um, we partnered with these six organizations here who together hosted 30 different events throughout the city and reached over 750 people. 
Through these, and, and I'll share a bit of the highlights as well for these, through these events, um, some of the themes that ran across all of them were major support for reliable, safe, equitable transportation options to access jobs, services, and education. There was support of climate change goals, and then the two most uh, talked about areas, again, were pedestrian related and transit related, um, and then bikes and the design and operations of our streets. So major themes from um, Clues, they hosted a series of different events focused on Latino family access to food. Um, there was the recognition that driving is really important still, uh, but there was the desire for more different options available that were um, safe, convenient, and affordable. That really reflects a lot of what we heard during our phase one engagement too, when we asked broadly the public, how do you get around now? How do you wanna get around? A lot of people are driving now. A lot of people wanna be doing other things in the future. Transit, safety, and safety of walking and biking were other major themes. Harrison Neighborhood, um, hosted a series of events focused on neighborhood residents and a particular focused on East African and Southeast Asian residents. And here there was a lot of comments around Olson Memorial Highway and safety concerns there, sidewalk maintenance in the winter, and then bike education um, to promote bicycling. So that's a theme we heard throughout several different conversations, the, the need to couple infrastructure and new options along with education. Minneapolis High Rise Council, hosted um, several meetings for public housing residents. And here, um, the acknowledgement that most of their residents focus or use walking, metro mobility, transit, and wheelchairs to get around. And so making those conven more convenient, safer, or follows would be very important. Um, and the winter maintenance, again, became a major theme here. Move Minnesota hosted a series of focus groups with MCTC students. And here the focus was on the cost of transit, the comfort of transit, and again, winter maintenance on our sidewalks. Seward Redesign and the West Bank CDC partnered together and focused on reaching Somali community residents. The focus here was again on pedestrian safety and access, making streets safer from crime. So we heard you know, about that as well and then pedestrian connections to transit being very important. Street Corner Letterpress was a group of artists that used an old printmaking machine to um, create these postcards that then students, they had two events at Edison and Roosevelt High School in Minneapolis um, and had students engaged through that platform and connected with over 200 high school students. So transit, again, a major focus comfort and safety of bicycling, and there was a lot of support for emerging mobility technologies. Finally, we have a phase two summary that encapsulates all of the different events we hosted throughout and all the different comments. We got received more than 2,500 individual comments, 4,000 responses to multiple choice questions. Um, through all of our engagement activities throughout the first half of the year. And I'm just gonna share a couple highlights, but there's a lot more detail again um, in our summary online. So we asked, at not, not all these events, but at many of these events, we asked folks, the city's got a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, and to do so we need to reduce single occupancy vehicle driving. What would it take to make you get out of your car or if you don't drive, not ride in a car as much? Top 77% of the respondents said better transit. More bikeways, 40%, and then shorter, shorter distances to destinations was the runner up there. We also asked, how would you measure the success? We know what our goals are, we know what we're trying to do. What are your top priorities here? So nearly two thirds said getting more people to walk, bike, and take transit would, show, would be a successful outcome of, of this work. And um, again, going to the land use, reducing the distances and frequencies that people drive. Improving equity of our transportation investments, a third of the people as well noted. We asked the question, what's, what would be the most transformative thing that could happen in Minneapolis over the next 10 years? And transit, I mean, if, if I had to summarize all the months of work that we did, the word, in one word, it would be transit. 
and it's evidenced here as well. Um, people are hungry for transit that works and transit that, that's reliable and safe. There's a lot of other themes throughout here as well in terms of looking with anticipation toward electrification and you know, making buses reliable. You can read things in here as well. We also, in our summary, have specific um, one-page summaries about each topic. Here are just some quotes I pulled out from what people were saying. So I'll just um, share a couple highlights around advanced mobility and technology and how that's impacting our system. Um, there was a real desire to see more access to these shared modes that are accessible by all people, so keeping equity and accessibility in the forefront of that conversation. With pedestrian topic, um, there was a real desire to see more streetscape improvements embedded as a part of how we deliver our capital projects, as well as um, a desire to see more pedestrian-only streets and plazas. Within biking and low-powered um, low vehicles, there was a desire to see increased access to scooters, bike share, and that we consider uh, non-traditional commuters when we're designing and implementing our bikeways throughout the city. With transit, there was a lot of support for bus-only lanes. There was a lot of talk about the affordability of transit and desire to either want to see reduced fares for zones in the city or certain population groups in the city or altogether free transit. Um, as well as the connection with winter maintenance as bus stops being a big deal. With the, in the freight topic, there was a lot of conversation around the, the space needs for delivering the goods, and, the goods around the city, particularly downtown, and, and having space to do that, so managing that curb, as well as incentivizing and encouraging the use of smaller vehicles on our city streets and designing then our streets in accordance with those dimensions and needs. Within street operations, um, a lot of talk around prioritizing transit over general purpose traffic on our streets, particularly downtown, to improve operations for those walking on our streets and to, to more broadly integrate our complete streets policy into how we do business. And then finally, in street design, um, a lot of conversation around designing our streets for slower vehicular speeds to increase safety that way, that there's more trees and greening on our streets and that there are space dedicated for all users. So that broadly summarizes what we heard. Um, a lot more detail, again, is online. And I wanted to end by sharing a bit of context for the draft plan that um, we're working on and, and how we're thinking about taking what we heard and where we're going. So a major piece here is our greenhouse gas um, emissions, the transportation sector is accountable for 26% of those for 2016 numbers. And within that, uh, nearly half is passenger vehicles and another third light duty trucks. So we've seen um, an increase of the, the percentage of the, the greenhouse gases accounted for transportation because of reductions in other areas. The trend line is a slight decrease within the transportation sector, but it's not been particularly dramatic between 2006 and 2016. So the city of Minneapolis, you, know, you all are familiar with the ambitious climate goals and ambitious actions laid out through these different plans and policies and challenges. And we're really looking and taking to heart how do we outline a series of strategies and actions that can, that can help us make good on these commitments. So the Climate Action Plan looked at a reduction of 31% from 2010 levels to 2025. And we're closer to 2025 than we are 2010 right now, and we haven't seen you know, the same rate of decline that, that we were anticipating here, despite you know, one of the pieces called out in the Climate Action Plan was to build 30 miles of protected bikeways, which we will reach. Um, and, and we're still not seeing those reductions. So again, bold vision set there, working on it. Are we going far enough? With the American Cities Climate Challenge, which the city uh, joined in 2018, really focused on the near term, next few years, what can we do to reduce emissions um, through quick implementation projects 
We've implemented bus only lanes on Chicago and have more coming yet this year as well as next year. Um, so there's work and we're tying to this work and learning from this work and seeing where we can take this and elevate it within the transportation action plan as well, as well as the idea of mobility hubs, how you can bring all the different modes together in a centralized space and let people have options. And finally, Minneapolis 2040 as well, you know, articulating again the commitment to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and then outlining a series of policies and actions there. Um, so this really sets the vision for us to do our work in the reduce, reducing the single occupancy vehicle <coughs> piece of our transportation system. Um, and you know, all these different reports and studies pull on different pieces and they have different metrics around electrification or the amount of charging stations or the miles of protected bikeways that we need. Um, and, and as we're working on this, it really is evident that these bold climate-driven strategies <coughs> dictate really bold strategies and actions um, through this transportation action plan. And so there's this consistent theme um, despite order of magnitude differences and actions set through these other pieces that really frame up how we are going to put forth our strategies and actions for our transportation action plan. And then finally, there's work that is happening concurrently or has been recently completed that also helps set the stage for the strategies and actions in our transportation action plan. Our Vision Zero action plan, which we anticipate um, releasing the draft next month. We've really, um, these two documents support each other in terms of the you know, street design elements and, and the different pieces. Our Greenway study is up on our city's website and that's um, evaluating the potential for different greenways and kind of how we can think about uh, implementing greenways throughout the city and evaluating some current and past efforts there. Similarly, our shared street study, which will be on our website shortly, um, does the same thing for shared streets in the city. Where do they exist? What are the best practices around that? And helps us set up, um, it was a, a research, an internal research piece that then helps us set stronger strategies and actions for our, our transportation action plan. So that's where we're at. We are actively working on the draft plan. We are, our team is out at open streets events, letting people know this work is happening. Um, we will be releasing a series of transportation talks with our planners talking about the different topic areas and what we heard from engagement. And we are focused now on getting the draft plan together in order to uh, release that for a public comment period. So I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments? Councilmember Gordon. Just a couple questions and really appreciate all the work that's gone into this too and the engagement that's done and the, the um, em emphasis of this presentation. When you, um, so my questions, um, you, you talked briefly about shared streets. Aren't all our streets being shared by other users? What does that mean and how does that, how is, I mean, greenways aren't shared necessarily because they're for bikes and pedestrians, but could you just define that a little better for me? Sure, thank you for the clarification, Councilmember Chair Reich. Um, so shared streets are, you, you are right that, you know, users can be on our, our, our streets are shared, right? But when speaking about shared streets in these contexts, um, and there's a lot of different names people have for this, Wooners, um, shared streets is the one we kind of settled on, but the idea that there's less of a delineation between space for cars versus bikes versus people walking. Um, so an example, that the city recently um, that we're evaluating is the West 29th in the uptown area, that couple blocks where there's no curbs and the idea is that there's more of a mixing within what one might typically think is the vehicular space. So what are the strategies, what are the design options that can make a street like that successful? Well, I appreciate that. Now I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm not sure that's the best name for it though um, in terms of um, marketing or when we want to explain to other people what we're talking about because it is definitely a different kind of street than we're used to which people will think is being shared by pedestrians crossing it and bikes and everything that's we're fair. talking about something that um, cars are seen as a stranger on the street and they're kind of uh, a little bit I mean that's the mm -hmm. idea this is more of a pedestrian area and so the bigger the vehicle they're visiting for a little while it's not built for them I mean, clearly highways aren't shared streets. So I know we have some that aren't shared, but yeah. um, anyway. 
Then I had another question about a slightly new idea that I also heard in the report. Mobility hubs, how large are they? How many are they? What do we mean by this? Is this just a bus stop with some bike sharing and scooters added, or is this like a, a major hub where commuter buses stop and drop people off, and are there different kinds of it? Just talk about a little bit more about it. It's an exciting and interesting idea, and I'd like to learn more. Sure, thank you for that clarifying question as well, Council Member and Chair Reich. Um, mobility hubs can be a range of things, as you just described almost perfectly, I'd say. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're planning on starting small and looking at ways we can you know, bring together or co-join different options, making it easy to transfer between one or another, that there's information available, but you can certainly scale up. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would, you know, you could challenge that we have mobility hubs where we have the dockless and we have docked and we have a train station, you know, on the light rail. And, you know, those are the beginnings of what we're seeing. And so how do we be a bit more intentional to bring those pieces together and have places where people can go and have multiple options that they can decide based on their needs that day what works for them? Great. That sounds like a fantastic idea to, to work out, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Paul Pisano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When we talk about Vision Zero, one element of that is traffic or speeding modification. And enforcement has varying degrees of support on that from a traffic enforcement police kind of response to that. The other piece of it is design, street design modifications, including sometimes speed humps. Um, today, as I understand, we have over 70 requests for analysis in queue and residents strongly lobbying council offices on how they get their street analyzed to see whether or not speed humps would be an option on their, on their block. Um, we also have a highly inequitable old petition and assessment process, um, a process I'm told actually no longer even exists, and yet there's no policy update being reviewed, or rather, I'm told it's not on any deadline, according to staff, and that it's actually not part of the Transportation Action Plan or Vision Zero. Is that true, or does do road modifications like this fit into the Transportation Action Plan at some point? Thank you for the question, Council Member, Chair Reich. Um, a, a few pieces there. The people talked a lot about safety, right, and feeling safe on their streets. And, and I think people oftentimes um, tend to jump to a solution and thinking this is the, this is the right solution. And so what, we're, what we are gathering and what we've gathered are those concerns, and sometimes they're broad. And the more specific concerns my colleagues within our traffic and parking services would get those, and I'm not as familiar with the processing on that side of a more specific this street concern. But in terms of a broad, in the context of the Transportation Action Plan um, and the Vision Zero Action Plan, what we're looking to do is make um, outline how we can make systematic improvements throughout our system to reduce speed through a whole series of, of design. You know, there's we've, cities recently got the authority to change speed limits as well. So there's, there's a whole suite of things as a city that we can do um, across the system to address some of these challenges. And I think what we heard loud and clear is people want to feel safe using their streets and not have that be the reason that they're choosing one mode versus another versus another. So I'm not exactly answering your speed hump question when it comes to how that's being processed and handled. Um, in terms of the level of detail within our transportation action plan, we're not anticipating actions that say put a speed hump on this street, for example. It's a bit um, more broad, like looking at how we can improve safety. Uh, Director Hutchinson. Mr. Chair, Council Member Palmasano, uh, you have a whole series of questions there that uh, some I'll address now and others I'm happy to talk with you. Further, um, we are going through a review of our traffic code right now. Um, it's something that I hope that we are able to propose changes to policy and code that matches the ideas that we're discussing in the Transportation Action Plan. I'm hopeful um, that in 2020 that will come forward. Um, we know that there is a high demand for addressing concerns on residential streets 
we do our very best to analyze them as they come in. We know it's important to residents who bring them forward. Um, what we're looking for when we're doing that analysis is uh, where um, the data matches the perception and we seek to swiftly correct um, issues that we have there. Um, but as you can imagine, we're, uh, we, we have all those 70 also um, and we have to prioritize based on, on data mm -hmm. and need. Uh, but we do recognize that there is high demand. As Kathleen mentioned, um, we do have authority on speed limits. Um, I mentioned that because you will be hearing more about that, and I've talked with several of you about this. Um, and I mention it because often when people are uh, worried about speeding on their street, based on the speed limits that we have now, they're actually not speeding on their street. Um, so we're, we have less that, than we can do, and we will have more tools. And in closing, I will tell you that you are going to be hearing in more detail the Vision Zero Action Plan, and that's coming before you in a matter of uh, a month or so. So we'll, I anticipate we'll be having additional discussions there. One more question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. My understanding is that the mayor has included in next year's budget proposal um, a line item of adding a, a person, a, a physical person resource to help us implement the new local control of speed limits. Um, are you suggesting that that would actually become part of the Vision Zero work? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Pomisano, that's not um, exactly my understanding, and I'm happy to talk with you offline about the budget. Um, thank you. I really do appreciate all the engagement going on here. I appreciate that what residents see as solutions might not be the actual best solution coming forward. Um, I just guess I want to press the point that the, the public is expecting to see implementation on some of these great ideas. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, first of all, I I want to say there's a lot of great outreach work that's gone into this, and I've uh, seen everybody at open streets, and uh, everybody braved a blizzard to come to a ward meeting uh, <laughs> in, in Ward 3 uh, that nobody thought anybody would come to, and in fact, we had like 25 or so constituents show up and staff showed up, and I really appreciated that. Um, one reflection I want to give on this presentation and and, and maybe a hope for the, the draft that comes out is uh, I think one of the challenges of community engagement and one of the strengths of some of the community engagement we've done previously is that we let um, challenging voices be part of the conversation. Uh, and so I'm a little bit worried, and I kind of can't believe I'm going to say this, because I take heat from these folks all the time, right? There are people in my ward who show up, uh, who showed up to this engagement event related to this, who, you know, the question here that says, what would support you in getting out of your car? I mean, their answer wasn't, uh, better transit or more bikeways. It's like, you can't support me in that. I'm, my life is built around my car, and, and that's what I'm going to do. And that was not a majority voice. That's not the voice we should be entirely focusing our efforts on. I'm not advocating for them to uh, win the policy debate. But I think that the strength of community engagement, I do think it's important that we see those voices represented. And so I hope that in the draft that comes out, if I have my constituents who are already worried that they're losing something feel like they got erased, um, feel like the input that they took the time to give uh, didn't show up. I can explain to them that they lost the argument, um, but if they feel like they weren't heard, um, that they weren't really a part of it, uh, I think that's going to be harder. So I want to challenge you to pull forward uh, some of the voices that are challenging to this vision. Mm -hmm. um, I totally agree with the direction that it's going in, but I think that I want to make sure that uh, that everybody's getting heard and that everybody's uh, at the table, because definitely I've had people take the time uh, to weigh in with a perspective that feels different from the one that's in this uh, proposal. And they live in the city too, it's important. Um, that being said, uh, I guess my other question is, so what's, can you talk through the timeline a little bit more about, hey, we're gonna get a draft in September, then what happens next and how quickly do we get to actually implementing policy that comes out of this? Sure, thank you for the questions, Councilmember Fletcher, Chair Reich. Um, one point on your first, first piece, 
absolutely there are there are opinions that differ from what we heard pretty loud and clear consistently and we have those documented and we heard those voices and you know pointing out even the one I the one quote I did read was a voice of the contrary like it's easy to drive so that's what I assume I'll be doing right um, so I think there there definitely are people who um, definitely had a challenge to some of this right and I think one thing that we were intentional about in terms of how we approached the outreach <coughs> is we knew that the vision was set in 2040. So we were asking more questions about how can we get there, not should we get there, right? How do we do this? Um, which is a little bit of a different question and I think tre trends toward then the answers that more focus on that rather than I don't wanna get there, I wanna keep driving because that's my life, you know, those types of things. Um, to your second question around um, the schedule, so the September the September date was for the Vision Zero Action Plan, separate document than the Transportation Action Plan. This will come at a later date. We are working on the timeline right now um, of the Transportation Action Plan, and we are um, working hard to, to finalize a timeline and put all this together into a draft plan. So I don't have an exact date to, to give you at the moment. If I may, I, I, I guess I just want to express my um, anxiousness to get this process moving. I think there's been a lot that it's felt like this year. There's been a sort of uh, let's wait for the transportation action plan. You know, as, as we have ideas, and I think a lot of my constituents have a lot of ideas and have a lot of uh, desire to see stuff implemented, and and we're getting tired of waiting for the transportation action plan process we want to start seeing stuff happen and, and and I just want to push everybody that like if, if there are delays that we can avoid if there are things that we can do to keep it moving along sooner rather than later we we, we want to uh, get to a place where we've got something we've all agreed on mr. chair if I might add here um, councilmember Fletcher we had a draft schedule um, we presented it to the policy committee there was a strong desire to uh, have a faster timeline, and that's the schedule we're working on right now. So know that we've heard that, and we're, we're working on it. Uh, it needs to be a well thought out plan, so hurrying um, isn't what we're after, but uh, seeing if we can cut down on review times, um, consolidate some of our outreach. Uh, we're really working hard to um, shorten, shorten the schedule. And I want to also be clear that there are many, many items that we're not waiting on, that we have policy direction, very clear policy direction that's currently in place with the Complete Streets policy, with our work on the um, American Cities Climate Challenge. Um, we have a number of items that we have uh, really catapulted forward, um, knowing that we have the policy support and we have the council's support to implement um, things like the bus lanes, like the mobility hubs, like the interventions on streets that we're doing in, in many neighborhoods. Uh, we're not waiting on those things. We have the tools we need. Uh, so I hope that helps. Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, like the chair, I'm a member of the steering committee, so got the chance to weigh in a bit earlier. And as the director said, have also been voicing this sort of sense of urgency because you know, even with rising housing costs, um, kind of creating a sense of urgency on that issue for my constituents, it's a pretty close match um, in terms of how much we hear from folks about concerns over speeding traffic in their neighborhoods. There's so much public support right now for making the changes that we need to in our streets. And I think even the ones that are more challenging, that are more constrained, I have a lot of them in my ward. After a year or two, people really start to adjust to it. Folks even who, you know, were very vocally concerned or opposed to things are like, oh, you know, it's in now. Folks love the fiber optic under Hennepin, even though we're still working out the details of that design. Like, there's a lot of community support. And I think as well, um, people are starting to notice the flooding increases that we have been planning for. And even if constituents or stakeholders or businesses in my ward don't immediately make the connection themselves between climate change and flooding, when I talk about it that way, they understand. And so I think there's also an opportunity for us to um, help make the case in the public for these ties. And I appreciated you saying we've met our goal, but our goals have been, you know, these individual goals of implementing, you know, protected bikeways or any particular thing, 
is it getting us to our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals on the schedule that we've committed to? And, and there is a real sense of urgency in the public, in the community, that we want to do our part. And so all that to say, I think there's a huge amount of public support. There's a sense of urgency in communities like mine, and much more so, I would say, in Cosmo Fletcher's ward, where there's been population growth and there hasn't been the kind of safety improvements or transit improvements or infrastructure improvements that really support that population growth. So we're playing some catch up. Um, but I also know there have been problems that have gone on for a long time, in part, um, that will be supported by the careful look that you're taking to data and making the case and really setting us, us up to make some big changes after this plan comes forward in the careful way that you're developing it. So I appreciate that too. And um, you know, I, there's a balance to strike there. I have some of the, the highest number of, um, you know, when we look at the intersections that have really high crash rates, a lot of them are in Ward 10, a lot of them are county roads. And we need to be able to make the case to our partners about why we want to see particular changes. I'm really excited about our the notion that we could take a citywide systematic approach to four lane roads instead of looking at one by one by one and saying, how do we want to look at this issue holistically in our city? Which ones do we see ADTs where we really want to try new things? How can that help us inform the ones that have higher traffic volumes or transit? So I think there's going to be so much benefit to taking this data-driven citywide approach. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with the balance to myself of like wanting to get stuff done in my ward, um, wanting to respond to my constituents' sense of urgency, knowing we're in a moment of really high political and public support to make the changes we want to see and just kind of building that momentum. So I think striking this balance of, you know, focusing on the data, bringing forward a carefully um, developed plan, but also trying things out, um, showing change in the, on the streets is really great. So. You know, I want to see the draft as soon as possible and also appreciate all the hard work that's going into the detail. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I will just uh, sort of echo the comments and observations of my colleagues. Um, I think all of them are, are poignant and on point. Um, what's that? Sorry. One moment. Council Perhaps President you. Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to give you the last word, so <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have interrupted you. I did want to say one thing about Vision Zero, because we have also been working on that for three or four years, probably since we launched it in maybe three, two. It was last term. OK. The years blur together for me. Maybe that's when we first started talking about pub privately. But um, So I also hear a sense of urgency about Vision Zero, but I know watching other cities um, that you know, especially around this issue of enforcement, which we do hear from constituents, cities that have rushed through that enforcement piece have had a huge backlash. And we know, unfortunately, even looking at our own department's data, that there is concerning trends around how enforcement has been used historically in our cities. And I think, rightfully, communities of color are concerned about increasing enforcement without increased um, assurance that, um, that having more traffic enforcement um, more aggressive approach to tra traffic enforcement isn't going to lead to continued racial disparities in traffic stops, which we've seen around the country. So I appreciate how much Public Works has really taken the time to look at Vision Zero holistically, to learn from the cities that we know where that has been a big backlash, um, so that when we, again, when we go forward with the Vision Zero plan coming out soon, that careful work has been done, those conversations have happened in community. I think it's really important, and a lot of it was behind the scenes. So, um, but again, I think will help set us up for success. And we look forward to that report in a, a few cycles. Um, so anyways, in conclusion, I think this is great work. I think the outreach was sort of the emphasis for this update. Um, you know, the old notion of doing it early and often certainly was uh, concluded uh, rather well in this first, first wave of input. Uh, but also I think that the, being intentional, targeted, deeper conversations uh, was definitely highlighted and will serve, uh, I think, the final product rather well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how we do get that, that um, um, you know, obviously we don't want to, you know, dally in our, in our input uh, process, but we also want to get that good feedback. We heard, we responded, what, what say you public? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I look forward to seeing that reaction. But I, but I also sense that we're going to get a lot of uh, positive feedback uh, because of the feedback we've gotten so far. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're rather well aligned I think Council President Bender says, well, when there's a political will out there, there's a sense of urgency, there's a sense of great demand uh, for a lot of the tools in our toolbox that we want to expand. And I think taking action um, 
is, is definitely anticipated, and I think we can be, I think, bold uh, in our sense of direction at this point, but we also want to be thorough. So uh, I will end with that and say thank you for the work to date and thank look forward you. to future updates Thanks. in addition to the other plans. Um, with that, we do have the item before us for a receive and file. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Dissenting nay. That carries, and we are now adjourned. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. There's a, actually something else that was not on the agenda uh, that we can cover now that we're adjourned. We do have a new team member um, in our leadership position. I will let uh, Director Hutchinson have the honor of introducing this person. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for this moment after the meeting. I wanted a chance to recognize and introduce you to Stephanie Johnson, who has joined us starting yesterday. That turned off by itself. Um, as the director of Surface Water and Sewer, she is already asking really great questions. You can anticipate um, a, a meet and greet and uh, some time to get to know her, and I just want uh, us all to wish her a very warm welcome. <laughs>